All right, turn with me to Matthew 27. Uh, we left off of Jesus being scourged at the order of Pontius Pilate. Once again, Pilate was trying to appease the religious leaders uh, in their lust for Jesus' death. Uh, they've been yelling out, crucify him, crucify him. He was hoping, Pilate was hoping, that if he scourges Jesus, which was brutal, as we saw last time, that cat of nine tails, 39 lashes across his back, he had little pieces of bone and rocks and you know metal sharp objects and it would just rip his back open and he's thinking if i do this maybe they're gonna you know say we'll have pity on jesus and let him go that was not god's plan but that's what Pilate is hoping for and as we'll see after jesus was brutally whipped and beaten by the soldiers they brought him before pontius Pilate again and according to john's gospel he is going to appeal to the crowd one more time to have Jesus released. But we pick up in chapter 27, verse 27. And so we just left off with them saying, he released Barabbas to them, then he scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Verse 27 says, then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him. And they stripped him, of his, uh, stripped him and put his, a scarlet robe on him. When they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head. And he read in his right hand, you know, mocking like he's holding a scepter. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they took the robe off him, put his own clothes on him, and led him away to be crucified. And so what a humiliating time this was for the king of kings the lord of lords they strip him they say they put this scarlet robe on him we saw in, in luke's gospel that the scarlet robe was given by king herod you know Pilate sends him to herod herod, herod puts his robe on him and it was, says it was a gorgeous robe that's what luke says and they just mocking jesus and so he's going back to Pilate with this and they you know after beating him they put this robe back on him what pain there must have been. I mean, you know, your back is bloodied and opened up, and then they put this robe on you, on your shoulders that are all beat up and whipped, and then they take it off, they put his other clothes on him, they'll take those off in a moment, and just the, the pain, the suffering. It says here they made this crown of thorns, they put it on his head. They take a reed, I don't think of some little wispy reed, I mean, it's like a bamboo pole and they're beating his head with his reed so it's driving the you know thorns deeper into his scalp i mean this is brutal i mean this was torturous it's interesting though after the fall of adam and eve what did god do he cursed the ground with thorns thorns and thistles and now jesus is in a sense taking that curse upon himself as he's wearing this crown of thorns and all the while it says these soldiers are taking turns spitting on him beating him mocking him and here's the incredible thing about all of this is Jesus is allowing this to happen. I mean, when I first got saved and I'm reading this, I'm like, well, why don't you stop it, Lord? I mean, come on, you know, fight back. But you realize, as you know, why he came, he willingly went through this incredible amount of pain and torture, especially the cross, for us. He's allowing in a lot of ways, the very worst of sinful humanity to be unleashed against him. He's allowing them just to do these things to him. As you know, Jesus will have the final say in all this. But look at these verses in Colossians 1, verse 16. The Apostle Paul tells us about Jesus. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, so everything spiritual, everything material created by Jesus, whether thrones or dominions or principalities, the angelic realm, powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. That word consist means are held together. So Jesus is holding everything in the universe together. Um, Scientists don't know what holds all things together because everything is made up of atoms, and atoms are filled with this, you know, the, the, the protons and the nucleus of this atom, and they're all uh, positively charged, so they should fly apart. 
So you take a magnet, both positive ends, you try to push the magnet together, it doesn't go together, right? Because it pushes it away. Well, that's what atoms are. They should blow apart, but all things are held together. So science came up with a great term because they don't understand how it works. They call it atomic glue or cosmic glue. So be that as it may, we as Christians know who holds all things together. It's Jesus Christ. Now, scientists don't know what holds it all together, but they do know, and they came up with about 70 years ago, how to release atoms. That's, again, the kindergarten version of how they came up with the atomic bomb, how to blow those atoms apart, and it causes great destruction. The Bible tells us very clearly a day is coming after the millennial reign of Christ when the entire universe and everything material in the universe, all the stars, planets, everything, our planet, Everything visible is going to be vaporized. It's all going to go up in a giant flash. It's all going to be burned up in tremendous heat. Look at these verses in 2 Peter 3, starting in verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. Again, this is after the millennial reign of Christ. And the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all of these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to His promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So again, what an amazing event that'll be. That's when Jesus is going to let loose of his grip on everything. He's the cosmic glue that holds it all together. He's going to let it go. And everything in the universe is going to vaporize in a giant nuclear explosion. It's going to be amazing. When we go through the book of Revelation, after we finish Matthew, we're going to see, you know, in chapter 20, after the millennial reign of Christ, then everything's gone. And the only thing visible is the great white throne. All the heavens and the earth are vaporized. And then all who have rebelled against God will stand before that great white throne. And then after they're sentenced, he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness will dwell. As Peter says, as it tells us in the book of Isaiah, Revelation 21 tells us he's going to create a whole new heaven and a whole new earth. And it's going to be glorious. It's all going to disappear in one massive flash. That's the meaning behind this verse, 2 Corinthians 4.18. It says, While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary. And as you look in the mirror and you go, Oh yeah, these wrinkles are getting bigger. Yeah, that's going to disappear too. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Now, I bring that up for a reason, because Jesus is the creator. He's the sustainer of life. He came into his own creation, and he lets his own creation viciously beat him and whip him and torture him, nail him to the cross so that he could redeem sinful men and women like you and me. So he is the one who's all, who holds all things together, even holding together the fist of those soldiers that are beating him even holding together those who are spitting in his face, even holding together the iron made nails that they drove into his hands. He held together the wood upon the cross in which he would be hung, hanging. He held it all together. Again, he did that because of his great love for sinful human beings like us. Look at this verse in Romans 5, verse 8. It says, But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Again, what love, what amazing grace on God's part to allow His only begotten Son to be beaten, to be bruised, brutalized to the extent that He was, and that's just the physical suffering that He went through. I mean, I, can't even, I cannot fathom the spiritual suffering that He goes through on the cross. We, we talk about the physical stuff. There's doctors that have written about what He experienced, the physical pain and torture and everything else. But the spiritual aspect, I cannot... Imagine because he became the very object hanging on the cross of all of God's wrath, all of God's punishment, all the judgment that all of us as sinners deserve. He took it upon himself. 
I mean, this is, you know, one of the reasons I always quote this ver these verses in Isaiah 53, starting in verse 4. Uh, every communion, I quoted these this morning. We sang these, song, th these verses this morning. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He went through that because we crossed the line. That's what transgression means. You cross the line. God says, don't cross this line. Oh, I'm going to cross it. I'm going to see what's on the other side. And we're sinners. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, our wickedness, our sin. The chastisement for our peace. The reason we have peace with God now is because he was chastised in our place. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Why would the Father do that to His only begotten Son, Jesus? I mean, the only plausible explanation is God loves you. That's the only reason. He loves you. There's no other reason for Him to go through this except for He loves you because we were lost in sin. We deserve the lake of fire. That's what every human being coming into this world deserves. We're born sinners. We have actions of sin. But Jesus allowed Himself to become the penalty, the punishment for our sin. 1 John 4.10 says, In this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sin. We've brought that word up a few times. Propitiation means the satisfaction of God's wrath. God has to have sin judged. He must be just. He has to deal with sin. You know, otherwise, you know, it's not like some people think, well, God doesn't care what I do. I mean, he's out there running the whole universe and he doesn't care about me. No, sin has to be dealt with. And he dealt with it by Jesus being our substitute. He was the satisfaction of God's wrath. He satisfied the wrath that we deserve. That's the epitome of God's love for us. How often do we think or say God, if you really love me, you know, why don't you heal me of this illness? Or, God, if you really love me, you know, you would give me this spouse. Or, God, if you really love me, why did you give me this spouse? I've heard that. God, if you really love me, why would you, you know, why would you do this? Why don't you do that for me? God says to all those, why don't you do? He says, no, you want to know how much I love you, you look at one thing, the cross. You look at the cross. We just quoted it, Romans 5, 8. God demonstrates His own love towards us, and while we're still sinners, Christ died for us. That's where Jesus exchanged places with you and me. There will never be a greater demonstration of God's love for us. Jesus went through all the pain. He went through all the suffering. He went through the death so that we could be forgiven of our sins, so that we could be restored to fellowship with the creator of the universe, so we could live with him forever. Before Jesus is led away to be crucified, Pilate has one last conversation with Jesus. Uh, again, we read about it in John's gospel. First of all, Jesus is standing before the crowd. He's beaten to, the, uh, you know, to a pulp at this point, barely hanging on. He's at the brink of death after this scourging because it would literally take your whole back off and your, a lot of times, kidneys, organs, your back rib cage would be exposed because it was so brutal. But he brings him out to the crowd and says, Behold the man! And here's Jesus just barely hanging on at this point. And as soon as he says, Behold the man, the crowd shout, shouts out even again, Crucify him! Crucify him! And Pilate says, you crucify him. crucify him. I find no fault in him. And then this is what we read in John 19, verse 7. The Jews answered him, we have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die because he made himself the Son of God. Well, he was. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was more afraid and went again into the praetorium and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then Pilate said, Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? 
Jesus answered, You could have no power at all against me unless it has been given you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. And then Pilate, he really starts freaking out. He's really trying to release Jesus at this moment. But the religious leaders are relentless. They say, if you release him, you are no friend of Caesar. You know, we, you know, uh, they said, uh, whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. Uh, we have no king but Caesar. And, and so they know Pilate has already had three strikes against him. He's had three revolts on his watch there in Judea. And he knows because it was told that Tiberius Caesar is going to kick you out if you allow another revolt in Israel. That's when he relents at this time to allow him to be crucified. He caves into the people. He gives Jesus up to be crucified. So look at verse 32. They're leading him away. Again, he's holding the cross beam. And it probably weighed 50 to 70 pounds. And he's just, you know, again, he is just bleeding out already with the beating and everything else. And as they came, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. So we're introduced to Simon of Cyrene. Cyrene is a city in northern Africa. Simon was uh, probably a you know, convert to Judaism, and now he's there in Jerusalem. It's one of the three feasts that the Jews were required to attend. And so Passover, he, he's there for Passover, and he hears this noise. He hears all this crowd, all this commotion. He probably just wants to figure out, hey, what's going on? He sees this guy coming towards him, this Jesus guy carrying this beam, and the two thieves are probably right there with him. They're carrying their cross beam. And he's stumbling and, you know, having a hard time. So they compel him to help him carry the cross. That, that means compel. The Romans would have their spear. And if they tapped you on the shoulder, <laughs> you had to go. You couldn't say, wait a minute, you know, I'm for defunding the police. I'm not going with you. No, you couldn't do that. If you tap you on the shoulder to compel you and you didn't obey, they would run you through with the spear. And so you can call a lawyer and get out of it. So he taps him on the shoulder. So Simon is compelled. He has to go. And here he is carrying, helping Jesus, <laughs> carrying the cross beam. <laughs> Can't imagine. Simon would have really been bummed out right now because here he's probably got his face right next to Jesus' face trying to help him with this thing. He's getting blood all over him. The blood of Jesus. Something must happen during this time because he realized Jesus is no ordinary guy. He's not an ordinary criminal. When all is said and done, Simon and his two sons, Rufus and Alexander, and his wife, they all get saved. How do we know that? Because of Mark's gospel. Mark chapter 16 or 15, verse 21. We read this. Then they compelled a certain man, Simon a Cyrenian, the father of Alexander and Rufus, as he's coming out of the country and passing by to bear his cross. So by the time Mark writes his gospel, everybody knows Alexander and Rufus. They're Simon's dad or sons. We also know from Romans 16, verse 13, Paul says, Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. So it looks like the worst day in Simon the Cyrenian's life turns into the best day of his life. He's probably the first guy to have his, you know, to be covered by the blood of Jesus. Amazing. He's cleansed by the blood of Jesus. So some along with, somewhere along the line, he and his, his whole family get saved. Verse 33, And when they had come to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, place of a skull, they gave him sour wine mingled with gall to drink, but when he tasted it, he would not drink. So the place where Jesus is brought and will be crucified is called Golgotha. There it is. That's an old picture of it. You kind of see towards the left half. Looks like two eyes and a nose. That's Golgotha. When we go to Israel, we always go there. <laughs> yeah, it's there now. You can barely see it in the hillside. The Arabs built the bus station right there. They like to ruin things. But right from there, it's like two-minute walk around the corner. You're in the garden tomb there, also known as Gordon's tomb. And so they call this place Golgotha, place of the skull. 
The Latin term is Calvaria. In English, we say Calvary. <laughs> so, Calvary Chapel. I guess that sounds more palatable than Place of the Skull Chapel. <laughs> That'd be cool. So some of you know Levi Lesko, Calvary Chapel guy up in Montana, and he's got a lot of satellite churches, and a lot of them he calls Skull Church. He has caught so much flack up there because that's a, that's a skull. That's death. Well, yeah. Golgotha. Jesus died in Golgotha, place of the skull. It's not on a hill up on top. It would be like where the buses are parked there because it's right outside the Damascus Gate, which is on the north side of the, the city walls of Jerusalem. They'd always take somebody crucified outside the gate. The Jews wouldn't let them be crucified inside, but the Romans would take them outside a busy gate, busy street there, and that's where they would crucify their you know, people, usually ground level, no more higher probably than me standing here. If you were walking by and I'd be on a cross like this, and you know, there's so many stories about crucifixions. Rome literally killed thousands of people. The longest person I read was three, 30 something days he was on the cross. Jesus will only be on for six hours, but people a lot of times would go a week, two weeks, hanging on crosses. It was brutal. A lot of times they'd leave him there even after they died and they'd let the birds come and pluck the eyes out. Dogs would start chewing on their feet. It was nasty. I know it's before lunch, but it was nasty. It was horrible, the things that they would do. So when we go to Israel, we always go to this spot. Um, the garden tomb, like it says, right around the corner. But they were the, the Romans are saying they always did it in a very public place because they want everybody to see somebody crucified. This is what's going to happen to you if you mess with Rome. So that's why they take Jesus to this place. It was a very popular place for crucifixions. Um, notice it also says in these verses, they offered him sour wine mingled with gall, and he refused to drink it. Why? Because gall was like a drug, like a narcotic. They would give it to him, sometimes, you know, out of mercy. Yeah, we don't want you to feel too much pain. But Jesus, when he tasted it, realized it's gall. He goes, nope, I am not going to drink that. And the simple reason is he was going to bear the full strength of punishment that he was going to, um, like the sting of death, he was going to experience it to the fullness. He was going to suffer and die on our behalf. He didn't want anything deadening the pain. I mean, he was going to experience it all for us. How sad, though, when you look at the world around us, how many people are trying to cover up or they're trying to hide their pain through alcohol, through drugs. Um, people are, are taking all kinds of stuff to try and forget things that have happened to them in the past. People take all kinds of stuff to try to forget what's happening to them in the present. But again, you don't need to anesthetize yourself from the pain because somebody who loves you more than anybody took all the pain and suffering upon himself for us when he went to the cross. What Jesus took upon himself is so much more than we could ever imagine, more than you can ever get from anything this world has to offer. So he invites us to come to him. And if you don't know Christ, you come to him, he will save you. He will fill you with his Holy Spirit. He'll remove, if you let him, he'll remove the pain, the suffering, the heartache, the broken, wounded heart. And he'll fill you with Love, he'll fill you with joy. Whatever he takes out of your life, he always replaces it with something infinitely better, like the fruit of the Spirit. So don't settle for the cheap imitations of this world. As soon as Jesus tasted it here, he knew what it was. He refused it because he's going to take the full measure of the cup of God's wrath. Remember what we saw last time in the Garden of Gethsemane? He's praying three times. Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And this is the cup he's drinking from God's punishment, God's wrath upon him. He's drinking it to the max. He's, he's going to experience the fullness of it. We who are now saved, we have the same Holy Spirit within us that Jesus had dwelling within him. That's why the Apostle, tell, Apostle Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8, verse 37, Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. So that means the victory over our flesh can be won as we yield ourselves to Jesus. Lord, I can't deal with this pain, this suffering, whatever it might be, but you can. You yield it to Him and He will do a work 
an amazing work in you. Look at verse 35. Then they crucified him and divided his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. This is out of Psalm 22. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Sitting down, they kept watch over him there, and they put up over his head the accusation written against him, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. And so even in his death, these Roman soldiers casting lots for his clothes, that's fulfilling prophecy. They don't understand it, but it's fulfilling prophecy. This sign they hung over his head, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. And this is now, you know, Jesus hanging on the cross. It would have driven the nails probably in his wrist. You know, archaeology has found nails in people's wrists. They found nail between overlapped feet, the bones and the nail through it. That's usually what they did. They would um, have one nail through the feet and then your nails through your wrist. Because if they put it here, it just rip right out. So they'd put it in your wrist and it would hold you up there. So a lot of times they'd tie ropes around you, depending on how long they wanted you to be on the cross, how long they wanted you to suffer. Again, Jesus will be on the cross from 9 a.m. to about 3 p.m. And when you compare all four accounts of the, the Gospels, um, Jesus being crucified, there's seven things that he says from the cross. Amazing things that he says from the cross. What we're, we see here later on, Matthew only records one of these things. That'll be uh, the fourth thing he says. But I want to look at these really quickly because these seven things, and the reason I called this message um, God's grace, or um, the cross, grace in action, because through his seven sayings, we see his grace, his mercy, his love, his forgiveness. What's the very first thing Jesus says? Remember, it's in Luke chapter 23, verse 34. So this is when they lay him down, they drive the nails in his hands, they fasten that beam to the vertical post, drive his feet into there. They have a little block of wood under the toes because the only way you could breathe on a cross because you were, they would bend your knees so you're hanging down. The only way you could breathe was to lift yourself up. Can you imagine pushing up against that nail through your feet? And you'd always die of suffocation. That's usually what happened. Because you get so weak, so tired, you couldn't push yourself up. Pretty soon you're just hanging there and everything just kind of uh, coagulates in your lungs and the fluid and everything builds up and then you die. So they lift him up, they drop it in a hole because they dig a hole for the, the post. Boom, he's sitting there. First thing he says, Father, forgive them. <laughs> they do not know what they do. What a glorious statement of grace and forgiveness. He come from heaven to earth for this very purpose. To stand as the mediator, the go-between, between holy God and sinful human beings. And even on the cross, he's in that place of a mediator. Father, forgive them. He's talking about the Romans that are spitting on him, that beat him, that nail the, the, put the nails into his hands and feet. Now, were they forgiven? Well, only if they would humble themselves later on and accept him as their Lord and Savior. But he's saying, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. They were totally ignorant as to what they were doing, totally ignorant as to who Jesus is. We're going through you know, the letters to Timothy on our Tuesday morning studies, and one of the things you read about the Apostle Paul, he talks about how he persecuted the church, he had Christians arrested, he was doing horrible things against the body of Christ, but then he says he did it ignorantly in unbelief. He didn't know what he was doing. He thought he was helping God. These people think they're helping God, or the, or the Jewish people, yeah, this guy's a false prophet. We've got to kill him. You know, we're standing up for Judaism. And they didn't know what they were doing. This is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, verses 7 and 8. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. I mean, that to me is the greatest truth that he could say at this moment. 
that he's willing to forgive these Romans that just put nails into his hands, nail in his feet, who have beaten him, crown of thorns, smacking his head, spitting on him. If he could forgive those guys, is there anything he cannot forgive you of? Is there any sin you've ever committed? Well, no, that's too big for Jesus. He wouldn't forgive me of that. No. I mean, that's why this statement is so amazing, because if he can forgive them, he can forgive you no matter what you've done. Because so many people think, you know, I, I blew it really bad, Lord. You don't, this is probably too much for you. No, it's not. There's not one thing that he will hold against you. If you'll humble yourself, confess your sin to him, he will cleanse, he will forgive, he will restore. Well, look at verse 38. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and another on the left. And those who passed by blasphemed, wagging their heads and saying, You who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also mocking with the scribes and elders said, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if you will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. So they're just mocking, they're reviling, they're you know, making fun of Jesus. Here we also see the two criminals were being crucified next to him, saying the same things. Come on, Jesus, if you are who you claim to be, save yourself, save us. They're, they're just mocking the Lord. But think about this. It's a good thing Jesus didn't save himself because he could have. Like he said in the garden when they were arresting him, I could call down 12 legions of angels and rescue me, but it was for this purpose that he came, to give his life for us. It's at this time, though, these two thieves, they're, they're, they're mocking him as well. Yeah, you're getting what you deserve. But then all of a sudden, one of those thieves is thinking, uh, it must be the conviction of the Holy Spirit. There's no other explanation. Because he has a change of heart. He's hanging there, dying, and all of a sudden, he's been mocking, he's been making fun of Jesus, and then he must have been convicted. Maybe just hearing Jesus say, Father, forgive them. Because we have this scene of this amazing encounter of these three men on their crosses. Look at these verses in Luke 23. Starting in verse 39, Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. Again, both of them were doing this. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, So at some point, the light bulb comes on. Do you not even fear God, seeing that you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward for our deeds. I mean, we're getting what we deserve. That's what he's saying. But this man, Jesus, this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, this blows my mind, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. I mean, how awesome is that? Not only does he offer forgiveness of sin to us sinners, he graciously provides everlasting life to anyone who will just call upon the name of the Lord. I mean, this guy is hurting. This guy is desperate. This guy is helpless. This guy cannot do anything to save himself. And yet at this moment, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I mean, what? I, I can imagine. I can't. I mean, just, just this guy hanging on the cross. Lord, remember me. And Jesus looks over and says, Today, you're going to be with me in paradise. That's the blessed hope we all have. All of us who have believed in Christ, all of us who have received Him by faith, we're going to be with Jesus always. But even more so, He will never leave us nor forsake us. He's with us always. He will be with us through everything we face, every trial we go through, whatever difficult times there are, whatever illness there might be, He's with us always. This is glorious. Because even when we die, like this thief, when he dies, will be escorted into paradise with Jesus. The salvation of this thief 
It's been a glorious example that, that it's never too late to get saved. You know, people talk about deathbed confessions. Do you believe there's death? Yeah, I do. I mean, it's never too late. Until you take your last breath, it's never too late. I mean, this is a perfect example. What must I do to be saved? That's what they asked Paul and Silas, the Philippian jailer. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. Do you have to get baptized? Well, not according to this. Do you have to do any good works? What could this guy do? He's just hanging around. Sorry. It just shows us he can't do anything for salvation. All he did is put his faith and trust in Christ alone. Jesus does it all. Paul reminds us of this, the two famous verses, of, uh, you know, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. This thief went from death row to eternal life by simply turning to Jesus. He didn't do anything. He couldn't do anything to earn merit salvation, but he placed his faith and trust, his hope, in Jesus Christ alone. That's the second statement. The third statement of Jesus is also found in uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 19, starting in verse 26. And this is when he looks down and he sees his mother Mary. And it says, When Jesus therefore saw his mother <laughs> and the disciple whom he loved standing by, that's John, he referred to himself a few times as the disciple whom Jesus loved, I mean, all the disciples could say that, but John's the one that does. He said to his mother, Woman, behold your son, referring to John. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. So even in death, Jesus is concerned for others. He's always other-centered. He's not self-centered. He's always looking out for you and me. It's amazing. He, here Jesus has moved as he sees the pain in Mary's heart, and he makes arrangements for her, even from, I mean, literally, again, hanging from the cross, dying in agony, he's still making arrangements for her, and the Apostle John would take care of her, it says, from that time on. This shows me that Jesus is also touched by the pain, the heartache that we go through at various times. I mean, he sees, now he's in glory, he sees what you're struggling with, what you're hurting, maybe going through a divorce or whatever it might be, he knows the pain there and he can make arrangements to bring healing, restoration, whatever he wants to do. This is why we are told in Hebrews 4, verses 15 and 16, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. And so, let us therefore... Come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I don't know about you, but I have a lot of times of need. And I go to the throne of grace often, as we all should. Again, don't ever think, well, I, you know, he's tired of me talking about this or doing, dealing with that. and So I won't show up. No, no, his throne room of grace is open 24-7. He's truly the God of all comfort. So the first three statements take place fairly early, the first three hours. And then it's weird because now there's going to be darkness over the whole land for three hours. And so look at verse 45. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, so getting close to three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, again, darkness for three hours. A physical darkness. I mean, it was palatable. It was probably like what happened in Egypt when God caused it to be dark in the land. Here it was for three hours, from noon till three. Jesus doesn't say a word during this time. And the sky is dark, but spiritually it's dark because it's at this time, these three hours, I believe, where he is absorbing in his being somehow, some way, the penalty for our sins. Dying in our place. Receiving the wrath of God. When he is paying the price in full for our redemption. So this is why he says, you know, Father, 
Why have you forsaken me? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God literally, I've heard say, he turns his back on his son because he's forsaking his son for the only time in eternity. Jesus, perfect in every way, God's wrath and judgment being poured out upon him. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says it like this, For he, that's the Father, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And this is why many refer to this as the great exchange, where Jesus literally exchanged places with you and me. Because I know what I deserve. I'm a sinner. I mean, if I had a scroll, and all my sins are on the scroll, and you'd roll it out. They would go out, out of the parking lot. Some of yours would go, roll out a few feet. Some of you, your sins would roll out downtown. <laughs> Some of your sins would roll out to Loma. I mean, it doesn't matter because we're all sinners. Mine would probably go farther than the parking lot. But anyway, it doesn't matter because he who knew no sin became sin for us. So we doesn't matter how long your scroll of sins is, might become the righteousness of God in Him because He gives you His very own righteousness. You're clean, you're forgiven, you're a new creation in Christ. So He cries this out. Now look at verse 47. Some of those who stood there when they heard that said, This man is calling for Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink. So this is like vinegar, and we'll see in a moment he will. And the rest said, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice. What did he say? We'll look at that in a moment. And he yielded up his spirit. So the people are clueless. So his fifth statement is, it's real short. It's in John 19, 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, He's received during that darkness all the wrath of God, all the judgment we deserve, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Simple little statement, I thirst. But it's only after everything's fulfilled. Well, you can imagine. So I, I taught at our um, get-together last night up in the mountains, you know, at our church camping trip. And I was having a hard time talking, and my throat's still really dry. Because you're riding dirt bikes for three hours, you know, and you're getting behind people and the dust is flying. You don't realize it until later. Though. <sighs> My throat is dry. I kept drinking water. So can you imagine hanging on a cross three hours? The only way you can breathe is to push up. <gasps> and just your mouth is dry. So I thirst. So they put up a sponge like vinegar. And the reason he takes this is so he can cry out. And he mentions here that he cries out. Again, with a loud voice. What did he cry out? John 19, verse 30. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. So with a loud voice. And that was followed by his seventh and last words, Luke chapter 23, verse 46. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, It is finished. He said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit Having said this, he breathed his last. But that statement, it is finished, it's, 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 a, it's not a cry of defeat. He wasn't defeated. That's a, it really is a tri triumphant cry. It is finished. The Greek is tetelestai. It means the price has been paid in full. We might say mission accomplished. He did the ultimate, the cry of victory. The task is complete. The price, I like, I like that phrase, the price is paid in full, because it was a, a financial term to tell us die. And so what was the price that was paid in full? Forgiveness for our sins. It was paid in full. What he accomplished on the cross through his blood was that our sins were paid in full. He just paid the price for everything we've ever done. We were born sinners, original sin. We commit acts of sin. He paid the price in full for every sin we have ever committed. His mission is accomplished. Only then, having paid that price in full for all of our sins, 
He says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He's not a victim. You know, earlier he says, nobody takes my life from me, but I give it of myself. And I have power to lay down my life, and I have power to take it up again. This is all part of God's plan. Again, when I was a new believer, I'd read this, and I'd be, oh, this is so sad. And then you start to realize, he did this for love, out of love for you and me, because he wants us to be forgiven. He wants us to spend eternity with him. This is God's eternal plan, his perfect plan to restore lost sinners and bring us back into fellowship. And it was all fulfilled through his sacrificial death. You know, one of the amazing things to me is when, uh, so we're going to start Revelation after we finish Matthew. When we get to Revelation 5, John's up in the, he gets caught up, he's there in heaven, and, you know, he's weeping and crying because he thinks everything's lost. And then he turns around because he's expecting to see the lion of the tribe of Judah. And when he turns around, he sees a lamb that has been slain. That's Jesus, still bearing the marks of the crucifixion. To me, it's a perpetual memorial of his love for us, what he went through to redeem lost sinners like us. The Bible is very clear. We were not redeemed with perishable things like silver and gold, but we were redeemed with the perfect, spotless, precious blood of Jesus Christ. He fulfilled through his sacrificial substitutionary death the perfect plan to restore us. This is why it's so ridiculous for any human being to think that there's something more they should do or could do to earn salvation. Well, thank you for getting me this far, Jesus. I'll take it from here. Don't ever do that. Don't ever say that. He who began this good work in you, Philippians 1, 6, is faithful to complete what he started. Don't ever think there's something more that you must do to earn salvation no, a thousand times no. What's the song we always sing? Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin has left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. 